Okay, good morning and welcome to the April 30th Division of Drinking Water webinar. Uh, I'm Colt Smith. I'm here today to start off with this. This has kind of been handed off to me. Uh, this is the first one I've done without Rachel in the room, so my security blanket has has disappeared for this time, so hopefully everything will be just fine. Uh, we have a great webinar lined up for you today, but we'll just do a couple of quick announcements. Come Reminders, uh, the first quarter violations have all been issued. Hopefully the letters have all gone out. So check with Waterlink and see if it's affected your system's IPS score. See if there's a violation that uh, was in error or that you need to take uh, steps to correct. Uh, check our online training calendar to see if there's anything upcoming at drinkingwater.utah.gov. Um, uh, there's a news item about that later. Sanitary survey season is also starting. Uh, if you know that your system is slated this year, you may want to check in and see uh, when that's going to be coming and get in contact with the division to see when we'll be scheduling those sanitary surveys, if it's been a while. Also, if you're a seasonal system that's opening up a campground or another summer use system, it's time to look at seasonal startup procedures and get the seasonal startup form filled out and submitted to the division to avoid the violation for failure to do so as you're starting up your system this year. If you need help and guidance on that, go ahead and contact us. Janet Lee here at the division is the lead on that and can walk you through the steps needed to address any of that with seasonal startup questions. Uh, you can watch these webinars for up to six months following their broadcast date to receive uh, continuing education credits. Um, those are available to you through a form located at the bottom of this webinar in the description. There's a link to a form to fill out that asks a few survey questions about training and your general knowledge, just to kind of help us assess what we need to better train on in the future. And then there's two quiz questions that you have to pay attention to the webinar in order to be able to answer and receive those CEUs. A couple of news items. The Division of Drinking Water website has gone undergone a major redesign and is in the process of continually being redesigned. Um, we originally planned on having next month's webinar be the department IT and communication staff presenting where you could find all of the stuff on our website, but we are doing some work to make it a little more user friendly and try and redesign it and put stuff there that meets our audience. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that for the next little while, we're not always gonna be able to tell you where to find things on our website. Water link should still be easy to find and link to directly from the website. Hopefully all of our forms and training information and stuff that uh, you, our primary audience are getting to are there. If not, reach out to us and we will do our best to try and find those for you. Uh, we've hired a new permitting section manager, which was formerly the engineering section. Nathan Lundstad has taken over the engineering section uh, and is moving forward with that. That's a new change to staff here at the division. Uh, we've created a new <clears throat> email uh, address. You're pretty familiar with submitting to DDW reports, all of your sample data, and you can still submit through there. But now we have one that's called IPS corrections. So if you're looking at that IPS, that Improvement Priority Systems Report on Waterlink, and notice that there's deficiencies you need to correct, you can submit those directly to DDWIPS or DDWIPS at utah.gov and those will go directly to our, DD, to our IPS correction staff, people who can facilitate that corrections. Uh, we've also launched a new form similar to the uh, seasonal startup form and the Myrtle form. If you need to request a corrective action plan following the assessment of a deficiency, uh, how to get to that and where that'll be linked to and how you access that's going to be upcoming in a new in a future webinar or future enforcement training uh, again kind of pending the website redesign where we're going to end up sticking that but in the meantime you can reach out to me colt smith at acsmith at utah.gov and i can send you a link to that and facilitate that if you need time fixing that um, additionally uh, next week is the quarterly division compliance meeting where we reach out to stakeholders from across the state as well as our district engineers and division staff, and we all meet together to assess future enforcement actions. This doesn't have a lot of direct um, meaning to you as a water system unless your system is a potential target for enforcement, and that's when rating changes and warning letters go out. Uh, that happens every quarter, so keep your eye on that. And if you see something on your IPS report that needs to be fixed, now's the time to do that. 
Uh, we will come back to that. All right, today's present or today's webinar is from. It's presented by with Elaine Boyd and Todd Stonely. Elaine is the executive director of the Intermountain Section for AWWA American Water Works Association. Is that right? Yeah, I, I'm pretty good with acronyms, but yeah. always check up. They're going to be talking about water efficiency and water loss control. Todd Stoney is with the Utah Division of Water Resources, so one of our counterpart agencies here at the state, and we will turn it over to them. Great. Thanks, Colt. You are welcome. Thank you, Colt. Oh, one more thing. If you do have questions, as always, you can ask them through the chat at the bottom, and we'll do our best to facilitate those there, but that is the only way to ask questions, and we do encourage those. Great. Thanks, Colt. Um, as Colt mentioned, I'm Elaine Boyd. I'm the Executive Director for the Intermountain Section AWWA. And with me today is Todd Stonely, my partner in crime uh, with the Utah Division of Water Resources. And we're going to be discussing um, not only uh, water loss control, but the programs that we've been doing the past couple of years um, to teach utilities about water loss control. Um, so today's discussion is going to be on how it generally works. We talk a lot about the AWWA M36 methodology and the water audit, and you'll hear those terms quite a bit. Um, the AWWA M36 methodology is really just the process that a utility would go through to determine their uh, water losses and identify implementation measures to reduce those water losses. We're gonna talk about the background of the Utah program, um, what we've done the last two years. We've, we've had two pilot, pilot studies um, that we've gone through. We're gonna give you, show you some of the results that utilities have uh, found by going through this process. Um, we're gonna talk about why water auditing is even relevant to you as a utility. And then we're gonna talk about some future programs that we'd like to implement. And before we go on, I would like to thank all of our partners. Uh, the Intermountain Section has worked closely with the Division of Water Resources, the Division of Water Rights, and the Division of Drinking Water to bring uh, this program forward to the state. So we're gonna go on with the M36 methodology and give you a little bit of background on that. Um, here is a, um, this is just an example of a sheet that I use um, in my, other, the other hat that I wear is a uh, civil engineer and I do um, review of erosion control plans and SWIP stormwater protection plans uh, for various municipalities. And this is just a sheet that I use um, to help me step through the process each time I do a review. And that's something that I've really uh, come to appreciate is that for any type of um, thing that I'm doing as an engineer, I, I like something that I can step through and, and I know what I'm doing and it helps me get a means to the end of what I'm trying to do. My husband, however, is not that type of person. He grew up going to Catholic school, parochial school, and so he never had shop class. And um, I always say when we first got married that uh, I had to show him how to hold a hammer. But And, and so anytime he went to fix the, something at our house, it he would take about six or eight trips to Home Depot before he could really get all the things that he wanted and really do any type of fix-up job. Um, and he'd get so frustrated in the process, and it would just frustrate me to no end because – as I said, I was like a process. And I'd always tell him, measure once, measure twice, and take some pictures with you to Home Depot because you can always get what you want uh, if you have those things in hand when you go. Um, so again, this is just an example process that I use um, for reviewing SWIP uh, plans, and it provides that checkoff list. And you'll see today that the AWWA water audit is just this similar stepped process. It helps a utility calculate their losses, find out what types of losses they have, and identify the costs of the losses and gives them a benefit cost analysis to reduce water loss, and then helps them with their implementation plan. So what is water loss control? It really is that accountability. Like I said, it's a checkoff sheet. It's a, it's a, 
audit um, that provides an accountability. It audits your supplies and your water uses. So there's a balancing approach to the uh, water audit. It helps identify the controls, as I said, and helps the utility minimize system losses. Okay, Elaine, thank you for that great introduction into um, what we're gonna be talking about today. So the M36 methodology um, and the water audit, kind of those are used interchangeably a lot by those in the industry. This is the industry standard tool for water system accounting. Um, it's well widely used in the United States as well as internationally. Um, it uses a water balance model where all water is accounted for. And it does away with this term that many of you are probably familiar with, unaccounted for water. It has a data validation component and it provides guidance on when and how to engage in water loss. So basically the water loss control of the audit process is a four step process. The first step is to determine the lost volumes. And that's where the water audit itself become, is a useful tool to, to enter that data and calculate um, other components of it that are, need to be calculated. It breaks the losses down into apparent and real loss volumes. The second step is to distinguish the types of loss. So breakdown of the types of leakage, which are real losses, and breakdown of the types of apparent losses, which we will discuss a little bit. Uh, in a few moments. The third step is to look at the economics, the costs of those losses. So once you've broken down the losses into individual components, you can assign costs to those losses that are appropriate for their different types. And then you can estimate what the cost of intervention would be and do a cost benefit analysis to see whether attacking those losses or trying to reduce them makes sense. Um, economically. And then the fourth step is to implement interventions. And the audit helps identify interventions that are economical. Um, it will let, let you know if leak detection is something that you should do or whether you should wait to improve your data validity to make sure that those leaks volumes are, are reliable. Uh, it will help with repair time improvement, pressure management, meter optimization, it'll help you identify when and how to go about those. And the accompanying manual that comes with the, the audit, the M36 manual, goes into great detail on all of these things. So this slide shows basically the data entry um, part of the free water audit software. The little inset on the right is what you see when you get into the audit itself. And uh, this is a free software that's available on awwa.org's website under water loss control. You can download it for free and, and start chugging data into it and seeing what uh, things you can do with it. Um, it provides several default values for items that you may not have a handle on initially. So you can start out with those and not get hung up on some of those data points that are harder to determine. Um, it has 13 total volume inputs. If you look closely on that inset, there's white cells, which are the data inputs. And then there, those are volume. And then there's also several data inputs, seven system data inputs, like my, miles of main, how many connections in your system, average operating pressure, and budget type things as well. And the thing I wanted to point out here, sorry to interrupt, That's was fine. that that it looks pretty daunting at first. And most everyone that opens up this software initially thinks, oh my, this is very, very hard. But what we found in our pilot utility or pilot studies the past couple of years, and we'll talk about this later, is that once um, someone goes through a short, maybe one day uh, training session, it all comes together and really there really is not, this is not that difficult of a process for most utilities to uh, complete. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, the hardest part probably is getting the data from the various sources within the utility together mm -hmm. in one place. 
that's where it kind of gets daunting. I have to talk to so-and-so and billing and I have to talk to the meter readers and, and so forth and the budget officers to get all the data that the required. But once you get those heads together and find out where the data is, it's, it's not too daunting after that. So let's talk a little bit about the water balance. The water audit is based on a water balance, um, meaning that all the water that is provided into the system has to be accounted for at the end of the system. So as you can see, each column in this little table here needs to add up to the same number. We start out with the uh, water supplied to the system, and then we check off what's authorized consumption and break that into authorized and water loss, um, water losses. And then we further break down authorized consumption into build consumption or unbuild consumption. And we break down the water loss component into apparent losses and real losses. And then you notice on the very far right column, we have what's called revenue water and non-revenue water. So we do away with this unaccounted for water and we categorize everything as either revenue or non-revenue, which I think is an excellent way to look at water because it's a valuable resource and we, we want to account for every last drop. And the audit does that for us. So if you look at um, plugging numbers into that, if we have a water supplied number here of 100, then every column as we go to the right will add up to the same number, 100. And you can see how that breaks down in this hypothetical example. 90 here and 10 here, and that adds up to 100. 80, 10, and 3, and 7, another 100 there. And we, we notice here a little bit, I don't want you to get tripped on up on this, but apparent losses are broken up into a few more components here um, that we won't go into much detail today. But it, it's really good at helping identify where each drop of water goes in the system. And then um, we want to talk about data validity. So each data input that you put into the, the, the water audit software, which is basically a glorified spreadsheet, it has a, a score that you need to put in next to each of those inputs. And it gives you very descriptive criteria of what your grade should be based on what you're doing, your practices, and what your current uh, data handling and, and things are in your system. Um, so it provides an overall score once you've put an individual score for all the items on a scale of 0 to 100. And that's what the scores will be um, relative. Well, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. And it really, the important part of this is it provides a quantitative measure of the reliability of the data. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the um, two pilot programs that we have done the last two years. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, and the purpose of these pilot programs was uh, kind of fourfold. Uh, the first was to really introduce this M36 methodology that we've been talking about and the water audit process to a number of utilities so that they could get comfortable with the process and understand what the water audit software could do for them. We also wanted to demonstrate the effectiveness um, to collect data um, and collect validated data that um, too, uh, specifically because in, I believe it was early 2015, the Division of Water Resources had a legislative audit um, that said that the water use data that they had been collecting was um, not up to par. And this data they'd been using to project uh, water needs for the state of Utah. And so the state legislative auditor came in and said, your data that you've been using is not reliable and it hasn't been validated. And so the Division of Water Resources was really looking for uh, a process that they could go through to collect reliable, validated data. And so the Intermountain section recognized that this uh, water audit process um, would be able to help the Division of Water Resources collect reliable and validated data. Additionally, the Division of Drinking Water also had a legislative audit uh, shortly thereafter um, that came out and said that their source sizing uh, criteria was not 
um, could not be could not be validated. They couldn't figure out how how uh, we can, the division had come up with these source sizing criteria and facilities facility sizing. And so again, we recognized that the AWWA free water audit software could possibly help the division of drinking water um, collect information to help utilities to determine source sizing requirements individually for each uh, their own utility. Another component or another purpose of this program was to really drive the utilities that were going through the process to implement uh, action plans to really reduce their water loss. And um, we'll talk a little bit about some utilities here in, in the next couple of slides and show you what they're able to do and uh, help them determine how to reduce their water loss. We also wanted to really help inform policymakers, the legislature in particular, the auditor in particular, particular, and also um, our state agencies, uh, inform them about the uh, AWWA water audit and how uh, by increasing the adoption of the methodology, we could help utilities and help the state uh, reach their goals. So the first part, uh, phase one, we did in the uh, fall of 2016. And um, we originally uh, invited any utilities that wanted to participate into a large group learning uh, process. They kicked it off with a webcast that introduced the methodology and then um, we had 26 utilities go through a day-long training event that introduced the auditing, water audit uh, validation methodology and how to assess their losses. We also, at that same time, had three pilot utilities, Orem City, Granger Hunter Improvement District, and Kearns Improvement District, go through a very detailed pilot where they actually went through the M36 methodology uh, with kind of hand in hand with uh, some consultants. They additionally had uh, a, another webcast that they participated in, and they also had an additional day long workshop that they participated in to get through their water audit from start to finish. They had, um, they also through this process, not only finished their water audit, but they also received um, a third party validation from our consultants on their data. And that was very helpful to them. So again, in um, actually in 2018, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, um, we felt that it was necessary to see uh, if the success that we saw with these first pilots was translatable to other utilities. And so we used, we had nine utilities that had actually gone through uh, the one day phase one training, um, participate in another pilot. They had additional webcasts, they had additional one day of training, and they went through one-on-one -on -one with our consultants to finalize a, the AWWA water audit and they got a third party validation of their data and they identified uh, improvement practices to help them reduce water loss. So we're just gonna talk about a little bit about um, a couple of utilities that went through this process. The first um, is Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District. Now Jordan Valley is a you know rather large um, wholesaler of water. They do have um, a small, uh, retail component as well. And they actually have about 9,100 service connections. Um, they operated a 70 PSI pressure. Um, but one of the things that I want to point out here is if you look at the graphs, um, the one on the left is actually their uh, total volume of non-revenue um, water. And uh, you'll see that that yellow uh, the higher yellow one is actually um, customer meter meter inaccuracies, and so they're 
they're realizing about a thousand acre feet per year of uh, customer meter inaccuracies. The blue line on the left graph is actually real losses. So that's actually water that is being lost uh, from their system. If you look at the right hand side, we have the cost of this water. And you'll see that that yellow line, which is the customer meter inaccuracies, is actually costing them more money than their actual losses, which is the blue line. So they are realizing um, somewhere around $575,000 a year in customer meter inaccuracies and only about $400,000 in actual uh, real losses. And so what that tells us is that they would probably, from a cost standpoint, be better served putting their uh, resources into fixing those inaccuracies with their meters. And that way they would reap the financial benefit uh, uh, better than if they actually tackled their real losses. Yeah. And one thing to point out there, the reason why the customer metering inaccuracies is more um, is costing them more is because that's valued at the retail rate, whereas the losses are just at the, the production rate. Um, so that's why the difference there between the volume and cost is so dramatic. Now this, the next one is Murray City. Uh, Murray was one of our second pilots. And as you can see on the left graph, they have, um, they have unbilled, unmetered issues, mm -hmm. <laughs> as well as, again, customer meter inaccuracies and real losses. Um, but again, if you translate that over into dollars, again, Murray City would be better served by putting most of their money into fixing those customer meter inaccuracies because they're obviously losing money from those inaccuracies. Um, but this does show you that each of these systems goes through this and comes out and each system is very unique. It's not a one size fits all. Um, and uh, Murray City does have some unbilled non-revenue uh, or unbilled unmetered, unmetered yeah. water that they should probably take care of. but. Their, their financial benefit of dealing with that would be pretty low. One other thing to point out here was the data validity score that Maury City received was a 49 out of 100. Jordan Valley received a 55. Now on a scale of 100, that may seem low, but it's an honest assessment of the valley validity of their data. And that's where they at, they're mm -hmm. at. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that score. And being in fact, being honest is with that scoring is important. And in this case, the third party validation verified that that score was appropriate. And later on, we'll show you too, how um, these are first year scores and they're they're right in the ballpark of where most utilities come in uh, with their scoring in the high 40s to high 50s is usually um, mm -hmm. round one of any utility. But as utilities do this, in subsequent years, their data validity score tends to go up as they do their improvements. And um, and this is the, the data validity score really offers us a, a kind of a barometer of sorts of how valid that data is and how uh, confident the utility is with their data as a whole. Yeah, it has a twofold benefit. If if this data were shared with the state, we would be able to see how that data is improving over time, becoming more valid. Mm -hmm. And then our projections would be more justified on the validity of the data. But also it helps the utility inform the utility when their data is accurate enough to make inter to take those steps of intervention to, to try to fix losses and other problems in their system. What makes economic sense to them? Exactly. Now the next one is Weber Basin Water Conservancy District, another uh, wholesaler of water, though they have very, uh, they don't have retail customers per se, um, but they came out with a data validity score of 48. And of course they aren't perfect either. <laughs> um, they do see quite a few real losses and um, they could put some money into recouping 
or fixing their real losses, um, unlike the other utilities. And then Lehigh City, um, they received a score of 52. They have about 17,000 connections, 310 miles of uh, service lines. And you can see again, the kind of recurring theme here is the total volume. Real losses is always seems to be the, the major part of that. And then in, in Lehigh's case, their customer metering inaccuracies aren't too bad. They do have some unbilled, unmetered that they could deal with. Then you put all that in perspective with the value, and you can see that in their case, um, the real losses is probably where they should focus um, their first attention to try to reduce those and recoup that revenue if possible. And the audit uh, process does give you um, specific implementation measures. This is, you know, we're kind of glossing over this a little bit by saying, oh, they ought to mm -hmm. put money into their yeah. real losses. The, the, the water audit software actually gives you very specific um, ways of going about that. And each utility, again, is unique. Yeah, I, I didn't point out here on the left, there's some um, recommendations that come from the audit. In Lehigh City's case, they need to look at the volume from own sources and try to improve that data. And customer metering inaccuracies, they need to improve that. And variable production costs, they needed to uh, get improve that data. So these were the priority areas for the next step that they should look at. And then I appreciate Elaine pointing that out. They don't need to go right after the real losses at this point, but improving some of that data first would be the best thing to do. Okay, let's just talk about the relevance of why a utility would want to do this. First of all, uh, with uh, changing weather patterns, climate control, <laughs> climate <laughs> issues, um, and the drought that we see continually here in the West, obviously reducing our water losses should be a prime priority for anyone. But there are many other reasons that we'd wanna go ahead and do this. Um, first of all, uh, we've seen a lot of scrutiny in the uh, papers recently um, regarding our water data um, and how uh, accurate it is and um, that the Salt Lake Tribune said with data based on guesswork, they're talking about all of our data that we've been providing to the, to the state agencies is guesswork. So our answer is unclear. Uh, the Deseret News independent analysis gives mixed reviews on Utah's water data accuracy. So, um, you know, it's in the news and the public is aware of this. And so we really need to get on top of it and be able to show how valid and accurate our data is. And then uh, recently, we had House Bill 303 that passed uh, the legislature this year. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, I would suggest that you look it up on the state legislature's uh, webpage. But House Bill 303 requires utilities that serve a population of greater than 3,300 people uh, to supply their non-revenue water over the last three years by March of 2019. So this time next year, all of those systems that serve a population greater than 3,300 have to provide non-revenue water. And the AWWA water audit uh, provides you with that number easily. Um, and for smaller systems, those between 500 to 3,300 population, uh, you'll be having to do the same thing by March of 2023. So, there, the legislature is telling us that we have to do this. Um, also, kind of interesting and, and not really um, promoted much is the fact that Standard & Poor's actually gives stronger ratings to uh, utilities that have performed a water audit consistent with AWWA M36 methodology. It's specifically stated as AWWA, it's M36 methodology. And they show utilities that are vulnerable if they have not performed a water audit consistent with those M36 methodologies. So there's a financial reason uh, that you would want to do that as well, especially if you were seeking funding. Right. And looking at the national scene of what's going on with audits, this graphic shows where various states are in this process of uh, providing validated data and, and, and reporting water loss. So the states in blue have, which includes Utah to this point, 
um, up till this house bill that we just passed. We had no water loss reporting policy or requirements. Um, all the pink states are basic water loss reporting. The ones in red are annual reporting using AWWA M36 terminology. So based on House Bill 308, I would put Utah somewhere between that pink and red. Um, it might be a stretch to put us in red because we're only requiring one uh, of the components and that's the non-revenue water. <laughs> Not the apparent losses, not the real losses aren't, aren't required to be reported, but you get to that non-revenue water by adding those other ones up. So I guess you could argue we'd be at red. And then there's a few states that have gone another step and they require annual reporting using the software. Um, but they require reporting and they require that you do the software and submit it to the state. Um, that's happening in Indiana and Tennessee. And then a few states have gone one step farther with validation, a third party validation of their data, California, Georgia, and Hawaii. Um, and it's interesting, California and Georgia, both of those states got into this because of drought. Um, that was the main incentive that pushed them to this. And they're continuing with it even after the droughts have succeeded. So it's a statutory requirement that they do that now. Um, just really briefly, this slide, Kind of the, the vision here or the purpose of this slide is to show that implementing this type of water loss management for an entire state would be a process that takes several years. And there's a couple steps that would be um, recommend, highly recommended we do as if we in Utah to decide to adopt this. And that's the first step is to st establish some requirement or some annual auditing requirement. And to support that, you would get training in the audit and providing outreach and technical assistance would all be part of that to get everyone up to speed to make sure they're doing it appropriately and doing a good job. Then um, you'd want to look to achieve a minimum standard of audit reliability. So once you identify the weaknesses in an individual system, you go and you attack those and try to improve the data validity so that what the audit is telling you to do has more backing to it. It has more valid data supporting the, the conclusions. And <clears throat> a component of that would be maybe a certification program to have third party validators who could come in and validate the data for you independently. Then the, the final step would be to actually implement or start benchmarking and, and implementing improvements to reduce long term or to reduce water losses over the long term. And so what you, oops, sorry. What you usually see if you look at the bottom there is that at first uh, statewide, the utilities don't necessarily have great data validity scores. Um, and there's quite a bit of water loss overall. But as time goes on into years three through say four or five, um, your data validity gets much better and the funny thing is you start seeing that there's actually more water loss and that's because your data validity is actually getting better and you're knowing that you're actually losing um, a lot more than what you had thought in the first few years. And then as time goes on, uh, your data gets better and better and your implementation measures start kicking in and, and water loss goes down considerably. And you, actually this is very typical, not only of a statewide program, but also with individual utilities. This isn't a one year thing. You do it once and call it, call it the end. Um, you know, year one, your data typically as a utility isn't very good. Your water loss, you, you know some of it, something about it. But as you get more knowledgeable about each one of these components, over time, you start realizing your data validity gets better. You start understanding your water loss a lot more, and then you're able to implement programs. Okay, this slide is kind of intimidating even for me to, to explain it, but I'll do my best. Basically what you have here on the bottom is water loss and you have cost on the, the axis here. So as the cost of what, as you lose more water, that costs you more as a utility. And at some point it kind of accelerates, that cost is getting, gonna accelerate exponentially as you have to deliver more and more water to make up for all the losses. The, whereas this blue line, the cost of intervention, if you if the water loss is 
pretty small in your system and you're intervening to try to, to capture that water and, and save it, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But if you're losing a lot of water, a little bit of intervention might save you a pretty good amount of water. So basically this black line right here is the total loss, the cost of water loss. It's the green one added to the blue one. And you can see that there's a place where that cost can be minimized and that's called the optimum, economic optimum loss and intervention. So it, there's on the either side, you have aggressive intervention, which is gonna cause you to overspend. You're replacing the pipes and meters before their optimal useful life has been met. So your cost will be high on this end, being too aggressive in your intervention. And then the cost of reactive intervention where you're not doing this, you're not fixing stuff until a leak um, appears on the surface. You're not replacing meters until they fail that you'd be overspending there as well because you'd have to deliver more water to meet the customer demands. So you wanna find a place in the middle at this optimum point. And the M36 manual and uh, methodology helps you identify and narrow that down to the optimum um, intervention level. And this is just an example of the city of uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, they've gone through this process for about 10 years. And as you can, let's just start on the bottom. The red line is actually water loss. And you can see that they've implemented practices to reduce their water loss significantly. However, if you look at the authorized consumption, which is the green, their consumption has gone up um, because of their growth in their city uh, quite a bit. And so the blue line is actually the water supplied. They've been able to keep uh, their wa water supplies pretty, um, pretty steady and equal to what it was over the 10 year period just by reducing their water loss. And so this is a great example, especially for, um, especially for areas that are strapped uh, for additional water. This just shows an example of where water loss can actually help you um, meet the needs of growth in your cities. And so just kind of as a recap, um, it, it's very difficult for me because to explain this because there are so many benefits for so many different organizations. Um, first of all, we talked about the State Engineer's Office, Division of Drinking Water, and Division of Water Resources. The nice thing about the AWWA Water Audit and the M36 methodology is it will be it will allow um, utilities to collect this reliable water use data, and then and then the state agencies will know that it's it's reliable, and they would understand where it's coming from. It's not just a number that's reported. Um, and it can help the state um, really with these demand estimates in the future source sizing and infrastructure capacity. Um, again, the legislature has their problems. They wanted to look for a, a valid process to assess um, how reliable the data was and the credibility of the data. And then, and so we've shown you how the water audit uh, provides that um, and could help the legislature understand um, how much better our uh, data is getting. Um, our utilities, especially, we really want to help uh, utilities and um, this will help a utility identify their water use and track and identify improvements and then track that over time. And that's not only good for utilities, but it's also good for water resources and drinking water who want to see uh, improvements. And there's this tracking program pro protocol with the uh, validation score that can help uh, the state do that. Utilities in the state, obviously uh, reducing losses would help us uh, stretch our existing supplies. Um, and so that's a real positive for the state and utilities. Again, we would be collecting reliable and accurate water use data through the water balance. And that really helps utilities understand their water use much better. And so basically, this, this process really targets our economic optimum, and so that's good for everyone. And we're just gonna quickly go over uh, some future programs. And this, this is just um, an example. As you remember at the first, I talked about my husband um, and how, how he frustrates me every time he 
goes to fix something at our house. But just a couple of months ago, I was so excited because he came to me and he says, Lane, we have this leak under our, under our sink. And he showed me and he had actually fixed it. This isn't the fix, but this is a picture that he took to Home Depot. <laughs> and he had actually measured everything and uh, measured it twice and took his picture and went to Home Depot and he ended up able to fix that leak just with one trip to Home Depot. So that just kind of goes to show you what a process can do for my husband who uh, is not a, not a uh, home improvement type guy, but um, a process like the AWWA water audit can also help utilities do the same thing with their water loss. So I assume you thought that duct tape would that was be a temporary the, fix? That was the temporary fix, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in the future, um, what we're hoping to do is uh, look at a targeted program. We'd like um, to really focus in on utilities that are serving a population of greater than 3,300 people. And that happens to be about 106 utilities, I believe, or 104 utilities in, in Utah. And they're obviously, um, as the map shows you, uh, kind of uh, along the Wasatch Front, up in the Cache Valley area, and obviously down in Washington County area is where those population centers um, are. But those 100 and five or six utilities represent 92% of the service population in Utah. And that's why we're trying to target just those for say another phase of this program um, and try to get um, a vast majority of uh, these larger water systems involved with water auditing. And that would give us a good starting basis for projecting future demands. And, yep. uh, that would needs. be the ultimate phase, everyone participating and doing audits annually. That yeah. would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're looking at an integra integrated program. Um, one, we would try to develop an input module um, that would link the water use reporting requirement um, that the state has with the AWWA water audit because everything is not exactly transferable, but a small program would be easily developed um, to kind of link those two together. We're looking at um, providing a technical assistance program to utilities so that they can uh, get the training they need and the help that they need to go through this process at least once and see how, how easy it really is. We're looking at um, setting up a uh, level one water audit validation program, and we'd like to get a certification program for auditors that can do the validity scores, mm -hmm. that can check uh, utilities. And then we're also looking at um, utilities submitting the data and the water audit to the state as part of this whole program. And so what do we have now? Currently, um, with our water use data, we have the online entry where utilities report what they, their water use. Um, they submit it to the state. And then um, the state, and many of you have gone through this, the state will contact you to step through uh, what your numbers, where your numbers came from. Um, and the uh, division of of water rights has been doing those, contacting those water providers this past year. And so what that really gives us is water use data, reporting and, and check data. Um, our proposed process would be developing this input module that I said that would link the two uh, AWWA water audit with the state's uh, data entry. Um, a utility would provide their water balance and self-evaluation to the state. Uh, they would also get a level one validation done, validating how accurate their, their data is, and that would be through a third party, and they'd submit that to the state. And so in the end, we're getting a much better, more reliable information that the state can use to do their projections and uh, set their standards in the future. So we're getting reliable water use data, we're getting water audits. We're getting a data validity score that we can track over time. Um, we're getting reporting like the previous process, but we're really getting validation on how accurate that is. So it really meets everybody's needs. 
Yeah, and I think there's a very good benefit for the utility because they get the recommendations of, of the audit of where they should focus some of their attention. They get the economical justified point of where they should be intervening and, and fixing losses and so forth. Mm -hmm. This one kind of uh, reiterates a lot of the benefits um, Elaine mentioned previously. I don't know if you want me to spend much time on no, this one. No, you Elaine. can just, it's just the win, 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 win. Yeah, the key message there is that we believe that this is a win, 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 win for everybody that uh, has an interest in the, this data, um, in the system operating efficiently and the water losses being reduced. There's lots of parties that want to see that and that we think this is a great tool to do that. All right. That's it. There's no questions. Okay, in the chat. that's good. That's pretty normal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you both. Thank um, you. It was great to have you. <laughs> Let me take that here. <clears throat> couple of things. One, I usually try and work as many trips to Home Depot in as possible. Yeah. Because if you <laughs> go to Home thing. if you go to Home Depot on a Saturday, what you see is is uh, it's generally people wandering around trying to kill time before they have to go back and finish the project. <laughs> they spend hours there. That's designed on my part. It's it's not lack of planning. Uh, to the other thing that it, it struck you went me to is parochial school too, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's I also didn't take a shop class. So that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, the other is that uh, I, I had a boss once who always said that if you can't count a problem, it doesn't exist. Um, and he was referencing specifically, he looked at sort of any government program, whenever somebody would come and ask for help and assistance of our office, uh, he said, if you can't give me numbers, it doesn't, the, the problem doesn't exist. And the, um, I think we're now being compelled to make the problem exist. And, get some accountability for water loss and conservation in Utah and excited to see that we've got some baseline and some tools there to help. So thank you both for coming. Um, we'll definitely have you back as this project progresses to see if you get new data and anything more exciting and see what some of those data validation scores, how they improve over time. To those of you watching, uh, if you'd like to get your CEUs, there is a link already there for you in the comments or in the description right below this video it says ceu link go ahead and click on that and it'll take you to the form to fill out and answer the quiz questions uh tune in next time in may sometime at 11 a.m 2018 we haven't picked a date yet or a speaker someday we will have that prepared for you in advance but that day is not today so thank you all for tuning in thank you for participating those of you and we look forward to seeing you in may <laughs>